Hey y'all, hey y'all, hey. So we're gonna get back into this book. Um, I have a little break from my son. I don't have any distractions around me right now. So we good over here. And today was a, it was a pretty good day, you know. Um, I got outside a little bit and cleaned up a little bit, cleaned up my space, opened up the windows and um oh yeah i made i made myself some smoothies and ate some fruits and vegetables and whatnot because i wasn't feeling too good throughout the day but i feel amazing now so we're gonna go ahead and get into the rest of i don't know we're just gonna go we're just gonna go until i feel like stopping um all right let's go so this suspicion is manifested in a rather per pervasive disrespect for black leaders, unless they come equipped with a supply of token or mystical power. The token power usually comes in the form of a limousine, some ostentatious clothing and some rather impressive jewelry. The mystical power requires identifying one's leadership as having some kind of divine legitimization. These leaders often gain considerable followings of an intensely emotional form. The other leaders who gain strong support are projected by the masters, media and press, and are often chosen from uniformed athletes, politically naive preachers, or even entertainers. The leadership of such persons seldom extends beyond, beyond their faddish and transitory stardom. Meanwhile, all other forms of small scale and large scale leaders, indigenous and otherwise, are destroyed by suspicion and disrespect. As a people, African Americans must begin to recognize the disposition which has been conditioned in us to reject natural effective leadership. If we understand that we have been programmed through our history to reject our natural heads, we may begin to become more conscious of recognizing true leaders. It can be easily demonstrated that the persistent distrust and limited support given to African-American leaders has its origin and the many inappropriate heads which have been affixed to our bodies historically. Okay, so next, the clown. Another popular character which has its origin in slavery is the African-American clown. One of the primary forms of remaining in favor with the slave master by the slave was to provide entertainment for the master and his household. It is easy to observe that a man exalts and his superiority over lower animals by teaching them to do tricks and to be entertained by those tricks. In much the same way, the slave owner prided himself in his superior, superior um, oracy by being entertained by the slaves. Writers have long pointed to the jester, the clown, or the fool as the inferior one who was responsible for making his superior laugh. Using a person for your clown has always been one of the major ways to assert your dominance over a person. Mockery is one of the more sophisticated forms of humiliation. Great favors of leniency and special rewards were given to the clowning slave. He enjoyed a special status above other slaves because he kept his master entertained. Even the arts, music, and dance, which had originally been used for cultural expression and community recreation, became devices which were used by the slave to protect himself from the master's anger. Fiddler in the TV drama Roots was a colorful example of this manipulative function of the clown. Clowning and buffoonery became one of the primary ways 
that the violent and abusive slave master could be controlled and manipulated. A laughing or satisfied master was less likely to be a violent master. Frederick Douglass observes in his autobiography, in all the songs of the slaves, there was ever some expression in praise of the great house farm, something which would flatter the pride of the owner and possibly draw a favorable glance from him. I am going away to the great house farm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. My old master is a good old master. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. This they would sing with other words of their own in provision. Jordan to others, but full of meaning to themselves. The problem with this pattern, as with others, we have discussed is that, is that this kind of response has long outlived its real usefulness. What began as a uh, what began as a survival tactic under highly unnatural living conditions has become a crippling part of the psychology of a people seeking to restore life and community to themselves. An overwhelming number of popular media presentations involve African American clowns. Comedy is viable unless it is alone. I mean, unless it's done to the exclusion of aspects of other facets of people's lives. The clear underrepresentation of serious aspects of African American life in the popular media suggests that even the former slaves prefer to laugh about themselves rather than improve themselves. The, <laughs> the buffoon Martin Lawrence in the 1990s and the bug eye JJ on the program Good Times in the 70s are updates of the 1940s and 1950s Stephen Fetchett and Manton Moreland. These clowns were updates on the slavery buffoon who mastered being funny to survive. This is not to degrade obvious talents of these master showmen, but to identify a force which has exhausted the clown while degrading or ignoring the scientists or the other artistic genius among African Americans. Entertainers and athletes are the popular heroes of the African American community. Physical prowess or comic exploit are the only characteristics black heroes are permitted to express intellectual acuity, prophetic vision, moral integrity, technological know-how, and the managerial efficiency of the characteristics seldom, if ever, portrayed. Consequence, consequently, the slave images of power persist African-American children as a consequence survive, um, strive to throw balls or croon on a microphone on microphones rather than seeking to explore the universe discover cures for infectious diseases or discover ways to feed the starving masses in africa or india such a preoccupation with impotent images was a device to keep the slaves aspiration in check aspirations in check these ball players and singers are still rewarded with airtime and salaries unimaginable, while black scientists and scholars are seldom shown and poorly paid. The consequence is that African American young people see greater po uh, possibility on the court field or stage than they even imagine for the corporate suit, laboratory, surgery, theater, or computer lab. The current slave mentality still exhibits aspiration to be anything more than a clown. The clear exception is Dr. Bill Cosby, who used the clown's role only as a tool in the educational agenda from his mind and that of others who were committed to the advancement of African-American life. An even more common example of the modern slave clown is a person who feels the necessity 
to be a daily clown in his interactions with Caucasians. Many people have observed or experienced the African-American member of an interracial team serving as the entertainer over lunch or at the party. Somehow, the token African-American always manages to be the funniest guy. It becomes an obsession on the part of the minority member to maintain favor with his colleagues by keeping them laughing. He often finds himself being urged. Come on, Sam, tell us a joke. So another old pattern with its roots in slavery continues to bring rewards on the modern stage. Human beings are unable to be about the serious business of living and building societies if they feel compelled to always clown or entertain others. People do not take you seriously if you don't take yourself seriously. A sense of humor brings necessary balance to an organized life, but a life of humor blinds one to life. Personal inferiority. Let us consider another one of the most destructive characteristics from slavery. This characteristic is a sense of our inferiority as African-American people. The characteristics have been discussed by psychologists more than any other. It has been used as an explanation for nearly every aspect of African-American behavior. The self-hatred or low self-esteem of African-American people has certainly been overworked, but is worthy of our consideration in this discussion. The shrewd slave makers were fully aware that people who still respect themselves as human beings would resist to the death, the dehumanizing process of slavery. Therefore, a systematic process of creating a sense of inferiority and the proud African was necessary in order to maintain them as slaves. This was done by humiliating and dehumanizing acts such as public beatings, parading them on slave blocks unclothed and inspecting them as though they were cattle or horses. They were forbidden to communicate with other slaves, which would have been a basis for maintaining self-respect Many historians and slave narratives report how young children were separated from their mothers because the mother's love might cultivate some self-respect in the child. Cleanliness and personal effectiveness are fairly essential in the maintenance of self-respect. The slave were kept filthy and the very nature of physical restraints over long periods of time begin to develop in the people a sense of helplessness. The loss of, abil the loss of the ability to even clean one's body and to shield oneself from a blow begin to teach the slaves that they should have no self-respect. These things combined with the insults, the loss of cultural traditions, rituals, family life, religions, and even names serve to um, cement the loss of respect. As the slave master exalted himself and enforced respect of himself, um, he was increasingly viewed as, superiority, as superior to the slaves. The superiority was based on the utter dehumanization of the Africans. The slave was forced to bow and bend to the slave owner and treat him as God. With the image of a Caucasian man, even as God, and with all, of, and with all kinds of images of the African as dirty and only half human, it was inevitable that a sense of inferiority would grow into the African-American personality. Carter G. Woodson in 1931 observed over a half a century ago to handicap a student for life by teaching him that his black face is a curse and that his struggle to change his condition is hopeless is the worst kind of lynching. It kills one aspirations and dooms him 
to Vega bondage and crime. This sense of inferiority still affects us in many ways. Our inability to respect African-American leadership, our persistent and futile efforts to look like and act like Caucasian people is based upon the sense of inferiority. The persistent tendency to think of a dark skin, to think of dark skin as unattractive, kinky hair is bad hair, and F African features as less appealing than Caucasian features come from this sense of inferiority, a lack of respect for African-American expertise and the irresponsibility of many African-American experts comes from this sense of inferiority. The disastrously high black on black homicide rate is in many ways indicative of fundamental disrespect for black life growing out of this same sense of inferiority. It is a simple fact that people who love themselves seek to preserve their lives, not to destroy them. The fact that we remain as consumers and laborers rather than manufacturers, planners, and managers has a lot to do with the sense of inferiority. The continued portrayal in the media of African Americans as clowns, servants, crooks, and incompetents maintain this sense of inferiority. The limited number of powerful and dignified images of Black I mean, of African Americans in the media and the community as a whole reduces our sense of self-respect. This is a continuation of the slavery patterns. Only those persons who look like, acted like, and thought in the same frame of reference of the master were completely acceptable. Those earning such acceptance were projected as far superior to those who looked like, acted like, and thought in the frame of reference of African self-affirmation. We can reverse the destructive effects of slavery by looking to strengths in our past and beginning to make plans for our future. If we begin to direct our children's attention to strong images like themselves, they will grow in self-respect. We must honor and exalt our own heroes, and those heroes must be people who have done the most to dignify, to dignify us as a people. We must seek to overcome the plantation ghost by identifying forces which lead to enslavement and self-abasement. We must definitely avoid the psychologically destructive representation of God in a Caucasian form, discussed in a later chapter. We must build and maintain strong, clean, and safe communities. The ability to influence our environments in some small way is the first step towards building and restoring self-respect. Community division. The point of this discussion is that slavery had and continues to have a devastating effect on the personalities of African American people. There is much overlap and connection between these traits since they have all come out of the same situation. There is also wide variation as to the continued affluence, influence of these traits on different individuals, but certainly they persist to lesser or greater extent within ourselves and within our communities. One of the most serious disturbances of community advancement coming from the slavery experience is this unity or community division. The age old pattern of divide and conquer was utilized along with so many other tricks in order to destroy African American community life. Wedges of division were thrown among the, sl the slaves in order to ensure that the possibility for united efforts would be nearly impossible. The slave makers were fully aware that a dis 
unit to community would be easy prey for the continued control by the master. Therefore, all kinds of devices were utilized in order to make sure that the slaves would not be able to come together. A speech delivered by white slave trainer William Lynch on the bank of the James River in 1712 well illustrates this strategy. I have outlined a number of differences among the slaves and I take these differences and make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, and envy for control purposes. Take this simple little list of differences and think about them. On the top of my list is age, but it is only there because it starts with A. The second is color or shade. Then there is intelligence, size, sex, size of plantations, status on plantation, attitude of owners, whether the slave lived in the valley, on a hill, east, west, north, south, have fine or coarse hair, or is tall or short. Now that you have a list of differences, I shall give you an outline of action. You must pitch the old black against the young black. You must use the dark-skinned slaves against the light-skinned slaves, and the light-skinned slaves against the dark-skinned slaves. You must also have your white servants and overseers distrust all blacks, but it is necessary that your slaves trust and depend on us. They must love, respect, and trust only us. Gentlemen, these kits are your keys to control. Use them, have your wives and children use them. Never miss an opportunity. My plan is guaranteed. And the good thing is that if used intensely for one year, the slave themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. There were major social divisions constructed by the master. The house worker and the field workers constituted the major separation among slaves. Those slaves with the lesser physical load of the housework were taught by the master to see themselves as a privileged group. They were permitted to wear better clothes, eat slightly better foods, and most importantly, they were permitted to take care of the personal needs of the master and his household. Just to be physically close to the master gave the slaves a sense of superiority over his fellow slaves. Stamp in 1956 described this phenomenon in the following way. The slaveholder needed the needed the willing cooperation of some of his bondsmen to make his government work efficiently. Knowing that the majority could not be trusted, he tried to recruit he tried to recruit a few who would be loyal to him and take his side against others. Usually, he found his ally, allies among the domestic skilled artisans and foremen, all whom he encouraged to feel superior to and remain separate from the field hands. In his manner, some planters gained the assistance of chattels who identified themselves wholly with the master class. The slaves who were the intellig um, illegitimate offspring of the master were usually given greater privileges. Along with the other house slaves, they were delegated authority over the field hands of the master. A tradition grew up giving those slaves with, with physical features like the slave masters a feeling of superiority over those slaves without such features. Stamp in 1956 again observes, but the most piteous device for seeking status in the slave community was that of boasting about the white ancestors or taking pride in a light complexion. In the eyes of the whites, the mulatto was tainted as much as a pure Negro and as hopelessly tied to the inferior caste. But this did not prevent some slaves of mixed ancestry, not all, from trying to make their Caucasian blood serve as a mark 
of superiority within their own casting. Among the house and the field, slaves there was not a constant designation and alternation of authority by the master in order to keep the community divided. Those given authority were made to believe that their welfare was dependent on the master's welfare and that they were independent of their fellow slaves. Therefore, they worked against the development of any unity among the slaves. The slaves with certain skills, such as iron workers, blacksmiths, or carpenters, were separated from the common field hands and made to believe that they were something quite special. All of these special categories of slaves were easily pitted against one another on the basis of their special classes or skills, which prevented them from dealing with their common status as a slave. Their total dependence on the other on the slaveholder essentially sealed their fate against their effective self-development. The inevitable conflict among them almost invariably worked for the benefits of the slave masters. The slaves' energies became consumed in affirming and defending their special class membership. Rather than addressing their real problem, the condition of slavery, the slaves' energy became consumed in affirming and defending their special class membership rather than addressing their real problem, the condition of slavery. The master fostered such rivalries since such false issues effectively distracted from the real issue. It seems that William Lynch's kit worked like a charm and it is still effective almost 300 years later. Divided communities among African Americans persist. The sophistication of the classes dividing the community has improved and the classifications have multiplied tremendously. Rather than house versus field, it is fraternities, sororities, schools, churches, white collar, blue collar, Republican, Democrat, neighborhoods, and hundreds of other bases for divisions. The root is simple, but the basis for the separation is the same. That is to keep the community divided. The origin of all the classes, clubs, and groups still come from the same source, an outsider who still profits from my division. Though perhaps not intentional, the divisive outcome is the same. The deeply entrenched predisposition to accept division rather than unity within our communities is one of the most deadly outcomes of slavery. Every leader or scholar who has attempted to address African-American community problems poses this destructive, this unity as the most deadly disease in our communities. On those fleeting occasions when African-American communities have unified behind an issue, our potency as a people has been awesome. Perhaps it is the potential power of such unity which forces those who profit from the status quo to feed the disunity among African American people. One would hope that exposure of this plantation ghost to the light of knowledge would facilitate its rapid disappearance. African Americans now, as we did 300 years ago, still spend more time justifying our separate goals than we do working on our shared goals. We are usually incapable of addressing our common problems because we feel that our separate problems are more important. This is another one of those constantly repeating dramas from slavery, which we continue to act out because we have not understood its origin in our not so distant slavery experience. The family. 
Probably the most serious effect of all was the impact that slavery had on the African American family. The family is very is the very foundation of healthy, constructive, personal, and community life. Without a strong family, individual life and community life are likely to become very unstable. The destructive or damage to the African American was accomplished by destroying marriage, fatherhood, and motherhood. Slavery does away with fathers as it does away with families. Slavery has no use for either fathers or families, and its laws do not recognize their existence in the social arrangement of the plantation. When they do exist, they are not the outgrowth, they are not the outgrowths of slavery, but, but are antagonistic to that system. William Goddell in 1853 describes the institution of marriage as it was viewed by the slaveholders. The slave has not rights, of course. He or she cannot have the rights of a husband or a wife. The slave is a chattel and chattels do not marry. The slave is not ranked among sentient, sentient beings, but among things and things are not married. Mm, 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 mm. Goodell continues in his graphic description of slave marriages. The obligations of marriage are evidently inconsistent with the conditions of slavery and cannot be performed by a slave. The husband promises to protect his wife and provide for her. The wife promises to be the helpmate for her husband. They mutually promise to live with and cherish each other until parted by death. But what can such promises by slaves mean? The legal relation of master and slave renders them void. It forbids the slave to protect even himself. It clothes his master with authority to bid him to inflict deadly blows on the woman he has sworn to protect. It prohibits his possession of any property wherewith to sustain her. It gives master unlimited control and full possession of her own person and forbids her on pains of death to resist him if he drags her to his bed. It serves the plighted pair at the will of their masters occasionally or forever. This description rather graphically illustrates the ultimate meaningless of marriage for slaves. Even under circumstances where the marriage ties were not arbitrarily violated, the very condition of slavery contradicted much about the vital and fundamental conditions of marriage. The African American man was evaluated by his ability to endure strenuous work and to produce children. He was viewed by the slave master as a stud and a workhorse. The stronger and the more children he could sire, the greater the expansion of the master's slave holdings and the greater his financial worth. The more work the slave could perform, the greater the production, the greater were the profits that came to the master. African-American manhood was defined by his ability to impregnate a woman and the magnitude of his physical strength. The virtues of being able to protect, support, and provide for one's offspring, which is the cornerstone of true fatherhood, were not considered the mark of a man on the plantation. In fact, the slave who sought to assert such rights for his offspring was likely to be branded as a troublemaker and either punished or killed. After several generations of such unnatural treatment, the African-American man adapt, adapted and began to resist the role of a true father. Today in African-American communities around America, we carry the mark of the strong arm stud from slavery. He occurs as the modern day pimp or the man who delights in leaving neglected babies 
dispersed around town. He is the man who feels that he is a man only by his physical, violent, or sexual exploits. He leaves welfare for a chance to the father. He leaves welfare for a chance to father his children, and he fathers his ride, his, his vines, or his pad. This particular behavior is often characterized as a racial trait attributable to some type of moral weakness in African-American men. Such conclusions fail to identify the real origin of such characteristics. Such family irresponsibility does not occur among, Afri does not occur among African people who have never endured the ravages of slavery or who were able to preserve their cultural integrity in spite of slavery. The African-American woman was valued primarily as a breeder or sexual receptacle capable of having many healthy children. Again, Goodell 1853 offers an example of a newspaper advertisement for African women which demonstrates the desirable qualities of the slave woman. A girl about 20 years of age raised in Virginia and her two female children, one four and the other two years old, is remarkably, remarkably strong and healthy, never having had a day sickness with the exception of the smallpox in her life. The children are fine and healthy. She is very prolific in her generating qualities and affords a rare opportunity to any person who wishes to raise a family of healthy servants for their own use. Her work as a human being was reduced to the particular financial value or personal pleasure she could hold for the master. As a breeder, she was to be mated with the plantation's strongest studs regardless of a human attachment. She was also usually expected to be receptive to the sexual exploitation of the slave master, his relatives or friends. Goodell, 1853, documents this point. Forced concubinage of slave women with their masters and overseers often coursed by the lash contributed and other class of facts equally undesirable. Rape committed on a female slave is an offense not recognized by law. Such abuse of African American women begin to damage the natural nature, nurturing and dignity of motherhood. Children were conceived out of convenience for an oppressor not even at the end of animal not even at the level of animal lust the children the child was doomed to continue in the very condition which had bred him or her many women either became abusive to their children or overprotective of them in response to such inhuman conditions even today we find too many frustrated young african-american women choosing to become breeders in their search for an identity. Mm -hmm. So many of those young mothers became abusers of those children or turned them into spoiled and irresponsible pimps by indulgently protecting them against a cruel world. The massive confusion around sexual identity so often addressed in the African-American media and periodicals has such foundation in the conditions of slavery. Men seeking to be men through physical exploits, sexual exploits, or even violence is predictable in setting where natural avenues to man have been systematically blocked. Women will experience inevitable frustration of their natural feminine aspirations when the paths to natural womanhood have been blocked. The historical images which we have inherited 
continues to sabotage many of our efforts for true manhood, fatherhood, and womanhood, and motherhood. In nature and throughout the historical development of cultured people, the roles of many and um, of men and father, woman and mother, have been inextricably bound only in instances of decaying culture such as ancient Greece, Rome, and modern Europe and modern Euro Americans America has this bond between has this bond been broken. With its breaks has come family dissolution, followed closely by total societal dissolution. Although current attitudes and conditions such as unemployment feed these patterns and keep them growing, the origins of the African American family problems rest in the plague of uh, slavery. If we understand the historical origin of these roles and patterns, then perhaps we will refuse to play them any longer. Okay, next, color discrimination. Certainly there are there are a few irrational influences from slavery that have persisted as well as this one. Although the prevalence of this color discrimination has, bad, has had periods of decline, it keeps returning in a more insidious form each generation. Skin color became the code for social position. <sighs> of course, those slaves who more closely resemble their slave masters in color, the more positive their traits assigned to them. Of course, the very condition of the African slavery was determined on the basis of skin color. The failure, failure of Caucasians and Native Americans to endure the physical abuse of involuntary servitude led to the more massive enslavement of African of the African. The contradiction that slavery presented for the supposedly free and Christian nation led to the justification of slavery as a divinely authorized activity. The African's black skin was considered as evidence for his cursed state to serve as a slave. Some misinterpreted Bible uh, um, allegory regarding the curse of Ham was used to justify the inhuman treatment of the African-American who was wrongly assumed to be a descendant of Ham. Therefore, dark skin color became equated with the reason for slavery. The skin color of the slave became associated with the other kinds of subhuman traits. On the other hand, the slave master's pale skin became equated with supernatural human traits. In fact, God, all the saints, and the entire heavenly host became identified with the pale skin. The logical conclusion of the abused, oppressed slave was that the basis for his condition was his skin color and the way out of his condition was to change that color. This deeply ingrained idea has persisted. Even today, there is um, an unnatural equation of Caucasian physical features with beauty, intelligence, authority, and so forth. Many African Americans continue to assume that beauty, competence, and worth are greater among their people with the most prominent Caucasian features. There are still vast sums of money spent yearly on skin lighteners, hair straighteners, and wigs in the frantic effort to change African Americans' physical features. Good hair and nice features are still thought to be those characteristics most like Caucasians, contrary to popular belief, 
These attitudes have not changed substantially among African-American youth who have grown up since the Black Power Movement of the 1960s. Following the social movements of the 60s, another limb grew on the color discrimination tree. There was an effort on the part of some people to equate African physical features with the mental and moral superiority. The same confused mentality that had established black as inferior and white as superior was evident in the effort to make black superior and white inferior. The perspective which limits the human makeup to its physical surface hue is equally limited regardless of perspective. One scholar has stated that he who remains ignorant of history is doomed to repeat history. One scholar has stated that he who remains ignorant, oh, I just read that. Certainly the persistence of our psychological, social and economic dependence on the former slaveholders is evidence of the validity of this adage. The intensity and brutality of the slave making experience traumatize our, our social and human development Though many writers have spoken of slavery, few scholars have addressed the continuity of the behaviors established in slavery as a continuing aspect of African American psychology. The one exception is probably Stanley Elkins, 1968, who developed a so sociological thesis that urged that the close nature of North American slavery, in contrast to Latin American slavery, produced a Sambo type personality in the slave. The Sambo was described by Elkin as docile, but irresponsible, loyal, but lazy, humble, but chronically giving to lying and stealing. His behavior was full of infantile silliness and his talk inflated with childish exaggeration. His relationship with his master was one of the utter dependence and childlike attachment. The problem with Elkins' analysts of the black personality while identifying a possible outcome of slavery is that he consumed his analysts into this single image. Our suggestion is of much greater complexity, but a similar recognition that the slavery situation produced some persisting personality traits. The reader might inquire with considerable basis that if this discussion is correct, then the African-American personality has been devastated. One would expect the obvious taint of this hum humanly demoralizing experience to have affected all aspects and all members of this community. In fact, the vast majority of African Americans operate with considerable efficiency and are generally no more severely disordered than are the people who were historically the perpetrators rather than the victims of these conditions. The fact that despite slavery, such effective functioning is the rule speaks to two factors which space will not permit adequate development in this discussion. The first factor is the apparent strength of character, culture and heritage that African people apparently bought, brought to America's plantation. Other people have degenerated in their fundamental humanity under conditions of stress, far less intense and enduring than those experienced by African people. 
Research needs to identify the elements of that African character, which might serve as a model for human strength in general. The second factor is that survival of fundamental human initiative among African Americans, despite over 300 years of the most inhuman conditions ever experienced by any people in the current historical approach is indicative of human resilience at its best. Despite the lingering vestiges which we have described in this discussion, recovery has been substantial. The triumphs of Americans, former slaves, far exceeds the defeat the deficit attributed to us. African American people exist more as a monument of human accomplishment than the remains of human destruction. However, the fact remains, the plantation ghost still hunts us. Our progress is still impeded by many of the slavery-based characteristics which have described previously. The objective of the discussion is not to cry victim and to seek to excuse those self-destructive characteristics created by slavery. In fact, the objective is to identify the magnitude of the slavery trauma and to suggest the persistence of the post-slavery traumatic stress syndrome, which is still the effects of the African-American personality. It is not a call to vindicate the cause of the condition, but to challenge black people to recognize the symptoms of the condition and master it as we have mastered the original trauma. Neither is this discussion an effort to underestimate the severity and barbar barbarity of the continued economic and social exploitation of America's former slaves. It is to call our attention to an array of attitudes, habits, and behaviors which clearly follow a direct lineage to slavery. It is hoped that by shining the lights of awareness on these dark recesses of our past, we can begin to conquer the ghost which continues to hunt our personal and social lives. We can begin to move beyond the shackles of restricted human growth that have bound us since the kidnapping of not so long ago. In the next section, we shall look at the processes of breaking the chains of slavery. We must understand that despite the impact of the slavery experience and the persistence of many of these characteristics, slavery behaviors, African Americans and other victims of this kind of oppression are not passive objects of their historical trauma. Have a great day.